I'm Jason Potts. I'm director of the Blockchain Innovation Hub, which was the world's first social science research institution to blockchain, which was started in 2017. And um, we're a bunch of economists um, that have been very interested in how this new technology will affect the economy. So what I want to talk about for the next 15 or so minutes is the question of, of what are the fundamental economics that sit underneath blockchain and a related question, what then does a blockchain economy actually look like? So these are two fundamental questions. What are the economics of blockchain? How does it, how, how will a blockchain economy work? So the, the, the thing we want to do, this, this might seem obvious at first, but it's, it's actually key to understanding where we're going with this, is in order to understand a, a blockchain economy, an economy with, with this technology, how, how do we analyze this? Um, we're going to use economics. So what economics though? So, the way in which this is currently done, and a lot of the sort of um, a lot of talk that we hear at the moment is around this concept of crypto economics. And crypto economics is, is essentially the study of mechanism design and game theory applied to a particular blockchain, a particular set of incentives, and so on. And um, we can use um, economics to study how we design incentives to achieve particular outcomes in a particular system. Um, that's crypto economics. We want to go beyond that. It turns out that that's, that's, that's a way in, but it's, it, it just addresses one blockchain, one particular system. What, we're, what we are actually interested in is not just one particular system, but all of the systems that come together to create an economy. So we want to, want to try and um, use a different type of economics other than just using game theory mechanism design to understand the blockchain economy. And for that, what we use is institutional economics. Um, this is a branch of, of economics that um, is, is based around um, the work of Ronald Coase, um, Oliver Williamson, um, Eleanor Ostrom, Oliver Hart, um, all, all of whom have sort of won Nobel Prizes for this work. Um, it also overlaps very strongly with a few other areas in economics called evolutionary economics, which is the study of of an economic system is an evolving complex system of rules and technologies. It's the study of constitutional economics, which is the study of um, an economic system from the perspective of constitutional rules that underpin the, the, the foundations of an economic system. It's associated with the work of James Buchanan. Um, it's associated with public choice economics, which is the study of the economic study of govern, of government, or of, 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 of government actors, and fundamentally of Austrian economics which is the study of the economy as a decentralized system of knowledge and information and essentially trying to resolve a coordination problem. So the key insights that we have in order to study how do we study the economics of blockchain and a blockchain economy is that we need a new type of economics, which is this hybrid of new institutional economics plus Austrian plus um, public choice plus constitutional plus evolutionary. And what all of this is doing is it's bringing together a perspective, a fundamental perspective, on the coordination problem in an economy. And different approaches to economics view this a bit differently. So the classical economists of Adam Smith and, and um, David Ricardo and so on, um, when they sort of look to study an economy, um, the industrial economy of the sort of 17th, 18th, 19th century, what they were looking at were factors of production, land, labor, and capital, and they wanted to understand how those factors of production came together to create um, the production of wealth and the distribution of wealth. Um, resources is what they saw. Modern economics um, shifted from there to emphasize the fundamental role of markets in the process of allocating these resources through an economy and using the price mechanism as, as a way to understand that. So we go from classical to neoclassical economics when we go from a resource planning problem to a market coordination problem. That's more or less modern economics um, up until the mid-century. Um, new institutional economics have, has, has a fairly sort of long history, but it's really only come, come to, to fruition in the past so three or four um, decades. And what new institutional economics introduced was a focus on rules, on rule systems. Um, and this was a study of, 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 um, of an economy as being made of institutional rules, now, whether these are behavioral rules, and habits and routines of people, whether they are institutional rules that make up law and, and governance, um, 
This is a view of an economy dynamically understood as a complex evolving rule system. Right? So an economy is made of resources, of things, an economy is, is, is coordinated with prices and markets, an economy is made of rules. Institutional crypto economics, which is what we believe the next phase of economics is, is basically going underneath that again to the level of ledgers. And what a ledger is, is a recording of social facts. And these social facts are things like identity, who is that person, and like property, who owns that cow. Um, things like contracts, what, is the, what, are, what promises have been made between these people in respect of this property. So what we have there is an ever deepening of our understanding of an economic system that goes from an economy of things, to an economy of markets, to an economy of rules, to an economy of social facts. And that's what the blockchain revolution is in the sense of why is this technology so important to understanding an economy? It is, it's a fundamental shift in the very way in which we, we record facts, uh, intersubjective facts that create property and titles and contracting and identity and so on. Um, we then build institutions out of that, that's the institutional layer. We then build market systems on that, which then creates resource systems. So this is, a, this is not just a new technology like lasers or 3D printing being dropped into an economy. This is a fundamental constitutional shift in how economies work. And it actually requires a new type of economics to do this. That's what we're, or what we're trying to build here. So we've called this institutional crypto economics. This is the new, new field. Um, we've written about this in journal articles and in, in, in medium posts. We've got a book coming out on this um, um, in a few months' time called um, How to Understand the Blockchain Economy. But what this really is, is institutional economics is the study of, of distributed rule systems in the economy, plus this new technology for recording facts and, 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 and so on, um, is institutional crypto economics. So the basic insight of institutional economics, of people like Douglas North and, and um, Oliver Williamson and so on, was, but fundamentally Robert, Ronald Coase, was that when transactions costs change, when the costs of, of doing things in a market change, what we expect is the structure, the organizational structure of an economy will change. Transactions cost shift, economies look different. More things take place in markets, fewer things take place in hierarchies. Economies evolve structurally when transactions cost change. What does blockchain do? It changes the cost of trust. Um, and it's the same insight. When the cost of trust changes, what we expect is that economic organization, where things take place, the way in which we govern economic activity, whether it's in firms, markets, hierarchies, will shift. So that's the sort of core insight that we see um, new, uh, institutional crypto economics is, 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 is um, revealing, is this notion that um, this new technology has come in, it has shifted the cost of trust, um, that cost of trust will cause structural change in economic organization everywhere. Before 2009, there were basically three ways in which all economic activities, three governance mechanisms in which all economic activity took place. It either took place in a firm, in a market, or in a government. Now, two of those are hierarchies. Um, governments and, and firms are hierarchic forms. So we either had market organization or hierarchic organization. And everything in an economy, all value creation processes were in some way organized in that, in that sense. Since 2009, there's a, there's a, there's a new type of, of economic um, organizational um, technology, blockchains. And this is how we sort of see, see economies going forward, is that some of the activity that used to take place in hierarchies will move to blockchains, some that used to take place in markets will move there, and some new things that were previously not done just simply because they were too, tr the transactions costs were too high, will move into the economy. So it's a structural change in the economy, and not a simply a productivity revolution that's washing through. All right. Cost of trust. Um, that's the key economic insight here in terms of the economics of blockchain is, is, is an economics of the cost of trust. And what we mean by this is in the same way that transactions cost are the cost of writing contracts and, and monitoring and so on, the cost of trust is significantly overlaps with that, but it's the cost of establishing um, 
um, relationships. It's the cost of monitoring and auditing, just basically checking each other's work. Um, it's the cost of verifying that things are true, um, looking up records and so on. It's all of the costs that would not exist in a world in which everyone only ever spoke the truth and all people and all promises were true. Um, in a world where there were only true statements uttered and, and um, everything could be done completely truthfully and honestly, what we'd have is we wouldn't have contracts in, in an economy. We wouldn't have hierarchies. All we'd have is I promise to do that. Good. It will be done. Um, there's no need for us to involve monitoring, agency, management, lawyers, regulation. None of those things are necessary. That's what we mean by the cost of trust is all of the things that we need to do in order to create, because value is created through trade and interaction, but um, we need things to be true. I need to know that you are the person who's allowed to do that and then the claims you're making are true. So costs of trust include transactions costs, but they go beyond that. Um, so that's what we, that's the, the, the these are the institutions that are, are, are being disrupted by this technology. Now, what is that cost of trust? Um, Turned out no one had ever bothered to measure it before because we've never had an alternative technology. Like, what else are you going to use other than firms, markets, and governments, right? So we we published a paper in um, this is the Journal of British the Journal of British Blockchain Association just um, a few months ago. We went through and we went through the entire U.S. labor force data. We classified every job classification. We estimated the fraction of it that was devoted to trust. We added it all up on the labor force side and estimated what fraction of the U.S. census data is devoted to trust. And we had no idea that number was that big. Our initial estimates were not an order of magnitude less, but a, a lot less. Um, we need to do this number again on an expenditure side and then do it again. Just to, there's a few ways we can, we can check this independently. But what that tells you is one in every three people, uh, their entire life, uh, the economic value they're contributing is just doing checking everyone else's work. Now, that's necessary. Economies do not function without this. this is, um, the more complex an economy, the higher that number will be because there'll be more specialization division of labor. Um, so the, the more globalized and complex an economy is, we can, the larger that is, which means that number is going up as well. And that doesn't produce wealth. It produce, it's an input into the condition of producing wealth. Um, you can do a little back of the envelope calculation and go that's $30 trillion worldwide right now. Um, that's how much we're spending on the cost of trust. So that's, that's why this matters. That's why a technology that fundamentally disrupts the cost of trust is a, um, a global economy-shaking technology. All right, and what? How does it specifically disrupt? Um, so we've been working through the work of Oliver Williamson um, in this. This is one of the key economists to sort of shape how we're thinking about this. Um, what cost of trust, I mean, what blockchain does is that it enables us to use promise instead of contract or enables us to, to, for contracts to work a lot more efficiently without monitoring and, and auditing. So um, it enables us to use one governance mechanism, promises and contracts, rather than another governance mechanism, hierarchies and, 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 um, and other such things. So what this basically predicts is that blockchain technology overcomes what Oliver Williamson called opportunism. Opportunism is the ability for you to um, create value for yourself by the fact that I have to monitor your actions or um, you know, just, it's not so much cheating and so on. It, it's just ability for um, one party in a contract to um, gain benefit over the other party to a contract unless the other party uses resources to stop the other one doing that, opportunism, right? Um, what does blockchain do? It limits opportunism by taking it by simply taking it, um, reducing the, the space in which you can potentially do that. Um, what does that look like? So our analysis of this, um, so, so, so this, this notion of cost of trust and, 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 and promises, not hierarchies, is, is the first sort of key insight in that. The second key insight is where that takes you. Um, if that's what this technology is doing, it's taking opportunism off the table, 
It's enabling us to make promises and those promises being automatically executable, which means I don't have to consume resources, um, monitoring and auditing and so on, your behavior. What? What does that do? Um, what this looks like is the economics of a three-sided market um, other, or a multi-sided market, otherwise known as a platform. Um, what a platform is, um, so you know, things like Visa networks and so on are, are platforms in, in a sense. They, they bring two parties together in such a way that a third party consumes resources or provides resources to enable two other parties to trade. So whether that's Google enabling um, people to um, find information about each other, um, whether it's Visa enabling um, merchants and consumers to, to trade. Um, what is going on here is that a miner or whoever is providing the proof of work or the underlying sort of trust mechanism is consuming resources, or burning resources to enable two other parties to lower their costs of trusting each other, right? That's, that's what this is doing. It's a platform technology in that, in that literal sense. Um, lowering the cost of trust, thus creating a platform. Now, what is that? That's what it means to industrialize trust. We, one party burns electricity to enable two other parties to trade without opportunism. We just industrialized trust. That's not, not figuratively, literally what we just did. Um, so, that's the economics of blockchain. It's, it's an industrial, it's, a, it's the next step in the industrialization process, but it's industrializing something that we've never been able to industrialize before to lower the cost of, to take opportunism off the table and then and thus lower the cost of, of contracting. All right, so this, this then becomes our way of understanding the economics of blockchain and the economics of a, what a blockchain economy will look like is it look contractually very different and organizationally very different. Um, this is the rise of platforms in this, or uh, basically protocol-based platforms, which are industrializing trust to enable promises to be made between parties without having to go via um, hierarchical organizations. Now, this is sometimes referred to as disintermediation, and that's sort of true. It's just as accurate to call that dehierarchicalization. Um, you're taking a governance mechanism out of the equation, replacing it with the ability of peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer promises to work in, in contracting. So that's the, the way in which we see the, um, what, what happens here. Now, I sort of haven't really touched on the, what that then does to information and the d distribution of information, but it massively powers it up. It enables local information to work so much better um, in, in this context. All right, so... There's a few things we can call that. We can think of that as digital infrastructure and industries utilities. It's a, it's a platform, but that's where this goes. And that was why this initial understanding of crypto economics as mechanism design on a blockchain um, is correct, but it misses the big point, which is what this does to industrialize trust. Um, and and, and as, as platforms and protocols. All right, and what? Um, one implication of this, so that's the, that's the underlying economics. It's just, it it's reduces the cost of trust and industrializes trust, enabling promises to work, overcoming opportunism. So what? Um, well, first, the first thing that this does is it completely changes the way global supply chains work. Um, and we're sort of starting to see a lot of this emerge already, but um, what effectively you have is, is that instead of having um, large firms sitting over supply chains where they are providing trust end to end over, and whether it's um, over um, trade finance or, or verification of provenance or, or using brands to, to do that. What you've effectively got is these will break into much smaller firms, much more specialized um, using, um, and, and therefore far more, far more competitively efficient um, to link into a whole series of, of, of um, emergent global um, um, networks. So we call these V-form networks um, um, as a way to distinguish the rise of sort of um, the sort of Chandlerian multi-form you know, large hierarchy that we saw grow through the 20th century. What we predict is basically a dehierarchicalization process that will unfold, um, both reducing the value of large 
hierarchical organizations over supply chains, but also reducing the value of branding and, and other mechanisms that you use for, for, for trust. So there's a few sort of big obvious predictions that come out of this. Um, the other one is, is just the way in which this stacks up as a institutional technology. So again, this, this, is, this is sort of a fairly obvious statement once you see where this goes, that blockchain as a protocol institutional layer um, that you can then attach in property rights and payment systems and so on. Um, that then becomes a industry or a platform layer for everything that is autonomously digital that you want to build on top of that. So again, this, this becomes sort of next generation infrastructure for a set of other technologies that will need to contract, that will need to be able to make direct contracting into that. So there's the sort of machine learning and internet of things and so on aspect of that. But the other thing is what happens underneath that is um, what this does to regulatory frameworks and law. Um, you hard code them in. They become part of the platform. And that sort of hard coding regulation into a platform. Um, this is something that from the Australian perspective, we've been particularly excited about this because what this enables you to do is if you're in a jurisdiction that has high quality legal frameworks and, and, and effective regulatory frameworks, you can now export those. So you can export them on the protocol platform, push it, push it out. Um, a merchant in Chongqing and a merchant in say um, Mumbai can trade with each other using Australian law without ever having to go via Australia. Um, Australia can export its legal and regulatory institutions, as can Singapore, as can Switzerland, as can America. Um, America has been doing this for a long time in terms of tax law. Um, but <laughs> but it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's one of these things that I think this is, the, this is what sort of globalization 2.0 looks like. It's not just you know, the classical economists looking at resources and you know, minerals and, and, and things being moving around the world. It's actually institutions that are now able to be exported and coded up and compete with each other in that space. So this, this notion of blockchain sort of as the infrastructure for autonomous digital technologies up, but it's also infrastructure for institutional technologies below. That's the, the layer it's playing. Um, what does that give you? Um, whole new types of markets emerge. So the one that we're particularly excited around is just, we're generally calling this data markets. Um, but it's essentially the idea that um, you have essentially self-sovereign property rights. If any information that you can put into a cryptocurrency transaction and send, um, that, you know, that's a secure communication and double spending problem solved. It's also a property right because I can prove that I had it and now I can prove that you, I don't have it. Um, I can, we can control that, but it's, it's, not, it's a self-sovereign property right rather than a central register government property right. So the reason that data markets emerge here is because of what blockchain is able to do to property rights um, in, 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 this, in, this, in this same context. So we're very excited about what this is gonna to do to the health sector. I think this is, the health sector is basically made of, of just data transactions and the, the prospects of having these things being organized through markets rather than being organized through large hierarchies is, is a um, potential source of huge productivity gains and innovation um, in that space. Um, Self-sovereign blockchains, this was an idea um, that um, we've been thinking, around, thinking about as well in, in terms of the way in which you can spin up um, your own abilities to, to project and prove claims and statements about yourself, about um, shared information. So this whole notion of thinking of this as a platform, as a, as a um, platform infrastructure that can be spun up to create property rights and um, trade infrastructure and, and regulation and governance, um, fit for purpose um, uh, and, and at, at, um, at whatever scale needs to happen. That's the sort of the direction this goes. Now, the thing that we've been really excited to, I mean, um, to work on in terms of um, with Agoric is, is this idea of nanoeconomics. Because this is, this is the obvious big next step that if, if you can do all of those things, then you can do this. And what this does is just take everything that we've been talking about before, which was just human to human, and push it into the world of machines. And it's the same 
logic, exactly the same logic of markets and trust and property rights, but now pushed down into a world of machines and objects interacting with each other. And that's, that's not a, um, that's, there's a, con a continuity to that. It's the same fundamental infrastructure. that We've never really thought of that before because we've never been able to push property rights into those spaces. We've never been able to push contracting into those spaces. We've never really had decentralized governance in those spaces um, in, in any sort of significant way. So what this looks like to us is um, that the economy itself has just gotten bigger um, in, in, in terms of just more and more things being brought into it. But understanding an economy of coordination, not an economy of resources and, and so on, but an economy of solving coordination problems, of things coming together to create value. Whatever those things are, whether they're humans or machines or whatever, it's all the same problem. What they need is institutional infrastructure to connect them all together. Those are markets, right? Um, but what a blockchain is doing is basically providing a way to spin those markets up without having to rely on centralized registries to generate them and to generate the underlying conditions in the first place. So that's that's the, the way in which we've we've been framing this um, economics of blockchain and the, the blockchain economy. And I'll finish there. Thank you. So I'm not going to take more than just a couple of minutes um, uh, to just explain a little bit. Jason has given us a wonderful overview of the, um, the models and the theoretical frameworks that we're working with. I, I just want to explain what we can do with those models and why we think it's such an exciting space to be in from both an academic and a really practical sense. So as Jason mentioned, we're the world's first social science research center into blockchain technology. We're a group of economists, sociologists, political scientists um, who believe that um, <clears throat> this as an institutional technology is not and should not just be the domain of engineers and computer scientists, um, but we actually need social science research to um, not just help understand the consequences, but to help guide the technology and help provide hopefully um, some insight about um, not just mechanism design, but um, uh, corporate strategy and so forth. And so that's 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 our mission, and that's what um, the RMIT Blockchain Innovation Hub was set up to do. So specifically, what we do is it, it, it's a range of things. We do the fundamental research. So Jason has explained the basics of institutional crypto economics. We're also looking at applications of blockchain technology using those frameworks into democratic outcomes, whether that's corporate democracy and voting systems, or that's political voting systems. How can you use this technology to um, not just empower voting mechanisms, but to actually change what we vote on and, and, and how we structure our political systems. Nanoeconomics is the program that we're working with, with um, Agoric, and we think that's a really exciting space to be in. We're also looking at on and off chain governance. We're looking at um, uh, post blockchain um, political economy. Once these changes occur, how does it change the relationship between citizen and state? And of course, we're working with a very large group of firms across everything from supply chains to health, all the way to crypto cities, geospatial economics. We're working with the legal center, uh, sector as well. Um, just trying to identify not just how blockchains can be used, but how will it shift those, those economies. What is really exciting to us though is the public policy focus as well. Um, uh, a lot of the findings that we've pulled out of that fundamental research have really significant public policy consequences. So Jason mentioned the idea um, of crypto havens, being able to export Australian regulation or legislation to the extent that that's, that's a good thing to the rest of the world when, when it's most useful. We're looking at mapping global public policy or what we call crypto friendliness um, to the, blo uh, uh, the global public policy settings for the blockchain industry. <laughs> We're providing, obviously, public um, policy advice. We're mapping global competitiveness in, in blockchain as well. We're doing um, uh, a, a wide range, of course, public education and so forth. We're also um, uh, trying, to, trying to make this change happen. Um, so this is a big focus of ours um, to ensure that public policy and the industry itself is, is being driven by 
what we think are our theoretical insights. And that's why we've established things like the Worldwide Blockchain Innovation Association, International Society for the Study of Decentralized Governance, and, and a bunch of groups like that to try to coordinate the industry because it's an industry that we think we can add some value to and, and social scientists can add some value to. And we, we hope to, to um, uh, provide some, some way of insight and, and, and research into that. Right now though, our research focus is, is very broad. Um, uh, we think that the theoretical models and frameworks that Jason has outlined actually gives us a new way into answering some very old questions and throws up new challenging questions. That's everything from how do you design consensus mechanisms that take into account the economics of voting, the economics of constitutions, um, uh, one of the big challenges in the blockchain space, as we've known, is, is on and off chain governance. Um, turns out economists and social science have been looking at governance for a very long time. We think we've got some insights in that space. Um, we've got some insights into corporate strategy. Um, if the V form organization um, uh, becomes a successful form of organization, what should firms do tomorrow? Not blockchain firms, but what should a um, investment company do? What should um, uh, superannuation or pension fund do? Um, uh, how should they respond to these big changes? How should we respond to the availability of new ways of corporate organization? Jason's mentioned data markets and, um, uh, and health, but of course there are big privacy questions there. We're interested in uh, using this technology and understanding this technology so it can be used in the developed world. One of the, uh, it's all well and good for us to be able to export Australian institutions, but what if people want to make a choice of Australian or American or Chinese or, um, <coughs> or European Union institutions in countries that have very broken institutional settings? So my colleagues and I were in Papua New Guinea, Papua New Guinea, one of the poorest countries in the world, very broken, very corrupt institutions. It, um, one of the things that they're very excited about is being able to layer better institutions on top of those old corrupt ones without having to reform the old corrupt ones. Um, we're interested, of course, in the evolution of property rights. That's, the, that's, the nano, that's as we understand um, and as we um, uh, suggest the nanoeconomics. Um, a research area. We're interested in what happens when platform or economics turns into protocol economics. And we're interested in changes to civil society and so forth. So we've got a really big research agenda. Um, it, it's a very exciting research agenda and it's based on a very rigorous model, a collection of frameworks and a model about the future of the economy. Everybody is pretty, everybody thinks they know where the future of the economy is going to go from blockchain to AI, to, to 5G, um, there's a lot of predictions about the future. We think we've got a model. We think we've got a rigorous model that can be applied and has real insights into, into the future of the Australian economy, the economy of the United States, the global economy, the economy of cities, the economy of machines. So thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. You mentioned the cost of trust um, and how lawyers and various things would be would fall into that. Uh, there's a at least a part of the job they do is not about truthfulness, but about finding compromise or representing interests, which might be entirely truthful but still not aligned. So the negotiation of a salary. You know, my, my, and so I'm curious how much, how to A, pull that out of the cost of trust, or whether you accounted for that in your model, or what your thoughts are about how that is affected by this space. Yeah, so, the, the, question, yeah. Question. Yeah, so the, the question is, yeah. is really around what counts as, as part of the cost of trust in, in particular circumstances where we might include bargaining, for instance. So um, the example of lawyers are there to, to vet and orders and, and so on, but they also spend a lot of time doing bargaining. That's true of management as well. Management spends a lot of time monitoring and checking, but they also do a lot of strategy and, 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 and bargaining as well. Um, now, there are obvious complementarities between those roles. You need, that inf you need to trust that information in order to bargain faithfully. You need to know the information is true in order to strategically deploy it to its best effect. Um, so there is an obvious reason why you know, in the world as we have it today, those functions are all bundled up. Um, what we did our best to try and separate that out um, 
it was a little bit hand waving and we sort of made some guesses, but we were we were recognizing that there are these distinct functions that are going on there. I think from us what this looks like is um, an unbundling process, an unbundling of the you know um, an unbundling of the strategic aspect from the monitoring aspect, an unbundling of the bargaining aspect from the um, the um, verification aspect. And you see this in like the some professions where this is very clear, and accounting is, is probably one of the best ones, where you've got part of the role of accounting is just to make sure firms are telling the truth. And firms we need to know that is to allocate capital efficiently. And want to figure out who owes what tax. But while you're there, and this is what the big four accounting firms have realized, as long as you're doing that, you're in a really good position to offer strategy services. So we just have a lot of modern industries have grown up around the ability to bundle those things, whether that's law, accounting, and so on. So I mean, what we basically predict is this would be, this could be highly disruptive of the professional services in the way that they've grown through the 20th century. Um, now, part of that is, is, is going to be unbundling off the um, the bits um, unbundling this out, but what's also likely, I mean, in the sense that you know, someone will do that and someone will do that, but that someone might not be a one, it might be a machine. And the huge productivity gain is that in the process of that unbundling, we can figure out which bits we can mechanize and which bits we require creativity and imagination. Um, that would be yeah. huge. Bargaining changes too. So, um, uh, one of the debates that we have in the institutional or crypto economics side is to what extent does blockchain change the um, balance between complete and incomplete contracts? So a complete contract is a contract that you can write where every contingency is planned for. Um, you know, if the, if the aliens invade, then, you know, I will pay you X, Y, and Z. Um, uh, but of course, we don't really write complete contracts because that would, you know, you can't imagine every potential con um, contingency. So you write incomplete contracts and bargain after the fact or, or have some internal structure into that. How does blockchain change that, that, that dynamic? Well, blockchain itself doesn't. It, blockchain helps enforce um, uh, and pr limit opportunism, um, make sure that contracts, once the terms and conditions have been applied, they'll actually transact. But, but Jason described the uh, blockchain as, as the sort of infrastructural layer for a bunch of new technologies. The reason that we don't have, the, the reason that many of our contracts are as incomplete as they are right now is because we have limited cognitive capacity to, to, to write longer and, and more complete ones. And, and so once you combine the opportunism reducing blockchain with the artificial intelligence or um, some sort of cognitive uh, a, a economizer, you can actually write different contracts and enforce them differently under a different institutional framework. So um, uh, a lot of this stuff has to be understood as um, uh, in conjunction with all the other weird changes that are happening at the same time. And that they will really affect the legal system. Yeah, and you can sort of see where this goes as well, because what it does is it enables modularization to be pushed so much further. Um, in the sense, you know, we can already, you know, and, and good lawyers don't write contracts starting you know, in the beginning, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> they pull modules together and assemble the contract, right? But the bottleneck <laughs> is still you need the lawyer to do the assembly because they know where the modules are. Right? So you've still got that, that, that sort of process. Um, that's a scaling problem, right? where the, the, the sort of human in the loop um, is the fundamental bottleneck associated with how far you can actually push that sort of specialization recombination. So I think um, this, yeah, this, so seeing this as an unbundling process and but what the unbundling process drives is benefits of modularity and benefits of modularization. And you know, what we know about you know, the origin of, of you know, where this economic wealth comes from is recombination of modules. So anything that drives modularization is simultaneously driving the prospects of an increased space of recombination. What is that innovation? Right. So again, this is an innovation platform um, that you know, the, the, the benefits aren't necessarily going to be concentrated to one particular group or whatever. This is, this is a broad infrastructural um, innovation platform 
because of this modularization aspect. And what we're just recognizing is that these costs of trust were the very thing that was stopping a lot of the modularization from happening because we ended up over bundling services or bundling a whole lot of things together because we couldn't separate out the you need to, to use the information, you need to trust the information, to trust the information, etc. So I think this industrializing trust has far-reaching consequences um, that, that are beyond just a and then this thing got cheaper. It's 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 it's, it's also a and then um, modularity exploded, which therefore means recombination exploded, which means which means um, you know, economic growth explodes. Yes. Um, the way in which you just brought in uh, artificial intelligence as an answer to the incomplete completeness of contracts uh, scares me. Um, uh, the uh, old common law understanding of a contract uh, is a meeting of the minds. In order for a contract to be meaningful, the contracting parties have to have a joint understanding of what it is they're agreeing to. Uh, the growth of complexity in contracts, forget blockchain and, and the digital world for a moment, just in the, the mainstream economy, the growth of complexity of contracts uh, has really reduced it's their utility as a means to bring about a meaning of the mind. Um, the uh, uh, people sign contracts all the time not knowing what it means, um, uh, and there's this other category of expensive expert called lawyers that the contracting parties turn to have to turn to specialized experts because they cannot understand what the contract means on its own terms. Uh, I think that the opportunity that we should be stressing more is the ability to have the, the meanings of the contracts be clearer and simpler. And I think to a large extent, uh, incompleteness is a virtue. The contracts can suffer from overcompleteness. And that it, for, for many purposes, we shouldn't be seeking to repair the completeness. We should be seeking to repair the complexity and the opaqueness. No, Can that's a question. Um, <laughs> uh, that that is a, that is a good observation, um, and it speaks to much more general pressures on those contracts that are sometimes externally um, uh, influenced. For instance, government regulation and so forth um, that requires them to be differently. Um, uh, but no, that's a good observation. Thank so, you. I see it as. Is, is this what, what you're describing, Mark, was, was a matching process. That, that, um, the current way we do contracts in the world is, is pretty inefficient from a matching perspective. That um, I'm not seeking to contract with a vast number of people because I just I, I don't know who would potentially trade with me on, on, on these various things. So we have matching markets emerge to bring people together when we kind of already know what they're trying to do. Um, and the market and protocol itself can provide some of the can offload some of the some of the um, ambiguity or the, the, the context into that. If you're here, you're here. For it. Um, so I think what we haven't really explored yet is or, or is, is 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 how far matching markets can be pushed. Right? I mean, to you know, how how much more of of of, of the society's economy and organisation can actually be built with matching markets. Um, so, I mean, I, 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 was, I sort of see it in that sense that, um, and then the other thing that's going on there is, is that we, we tend to overuse lawyers and other sort of expensive professional services for dealing with the checking and, and just ensuring that you, you, you are who you say you are, you've got the asset that you claim to be trying to sell, et cetera, et cetera, as opposed to doing the difficult bargaining meeting of the minds, is this what you really meant, and so on. So um, we possibly just simply misallocate a lot of our valuable lawyering and resources um, because we're spending so much of them on, on cost of trust. So, yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting point. Yeah. Um, so there's an issue that 
seems to have started at the start of the internet, where the cypherpunks and the crypto anarchists were saying that the internet was going to be this new home of the mind, and that the physical world and you know the, the current governments had no jurisdiction over this new home of the mind. Do you see a similar uh, thought process pop up between blockchains and the physical world? And I think um, you both had mentioned the possibility of using blockchains as institutional technology uh, in areas of the world that don't necessarily have good institutions. So I'm curious as to what your thoughts are um, and how the institutional technology meets uh, uh, the road and uh, how it actually can handle violence, physical violence and things like that. Yeah. So two, there's, two, there's two questions bound up in there. This is the question of, of, of how um, a sort of self-sovereign institutional technology can exist in a world um, of physical violence and, and so on, and how you square that sort of um, Hobbesian um, problem in that space. Um, two things. One is, what is striking about the development of the blockchain and, 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 and um, crypto currency space is how community driven it is like it, it came out of the open source software community um, it's a lot of the values that are underpinning it um, you know, are not you know, anonymous people on the internet it's a community that's coming together to try and do a thing and build a technology together there's a real commonsing aspect to it to this that, that, that shouldn't be overlooked um, all commons have this problem of, of how you punish free riders and how you, um, how, you, how you deal with that. So what I think is going on is we, we haven't figured that one out yet. Um, what does punishment look like in this world? Um, can we do on-platform punishment? Now, um, because off-platform punishment we can, we, we call them cages, right? You just put, put someone in a cage and that's... We're done. Or we can use fines. But fines need to be enforced. How do you enforce them? Cages, right? Um, what blockchain punishments, I think, we've, we've, been think we've been talking about this a lot, um, will look like, is basically this um, banishment. Um, the way, the, historically, the way you do punishment before the invention of cages was you banish someone from joining the, the, the community. And I think that, you're, that that notion of being sort of kicked off a platform, you say, well, okay, if it's a communication platform, if it's just a social message, of being, well, then I can't talk to my friends. That's sad. If my assets are on that platform and I'm off the platform, I've lost my assets. Right? So there's, there's, there's a difference between a communication platform and messaging versus an infrastructural platform that holds property rights and wealth and value. Um, a threat of banishment from that is equivalent to a threat of confiscation of your assets. That's a fine. Right? So, it's, uh, so I, think, I think we'll get there, and I'm pretty sure that's the way it'll work. Um, it might not be banishment completely, it might be timed out for a while, but the way the punishment is working is it's basically a fine, you're losing your assets and, and economic property rights, um, and that Loss of property rights is being protocol governed. Now, you know, we're, we're, we're only a few years deep into this. Um, I imagine this will be the sort of, this will be the big sort of political discussions that, that, are, that are going forward on this, but I think the mechanism will be that. Um, the value is on the platform. The punishment for bad behavior on the platform is not just banishment of you but, and all of the value that you've got on that. Um, then the flip side of that is the reward for good behavior is that you, you, you get to join the platform. Right? So again, I think that the analog of this is actually possibly quite similar to a lot of citizenship discussions and things like that. Um, so I think you know, that is the right question to ask. We're still very early in this space, um, but it's, it's not going to look the same way that it's not going to be done with cages. I, I sort of see it very briefly as a subset of just a more general interface question. So we, we deal with this in the supply chain. So you put information about a good 
onto a blockchain, um, um, who says that that information was correct at that given time? If you've got a little QR code sticker and you pop it on the beef and it goes to China, well, what if someone took the sticker off and put it on something else? Um, uh, so, and and we've got we've got ways to deal with that, and we are developing ways to deal with that. Um, uh, the uh, uh, working on a blockchain. If you if you could in any way spend your whole life on Bitcoin, yes, theoretically you'd be away from all government, but A, they could knock on your door because you've got hidden assets, or um, they could prevent you taking the money out and converting into fiat currency. These are, uh, these are genuinely really, really big problems that we have to deal with, with again, those, those second layers of, of institutional technologies. And the story that Jason um, is explaining, that tells you that the big interface question here is about um, the interface between the blockchain world or the internet world and identity um, and how we link these identities in together because if we want to go down a club style route which is what Jason's describing we'll need um, really high quality identity technologies that people want, will care about losing or care about um, protecting or they will get benefits for maintaining or that sort of thing that that is um, that, that is a 10 20 year uh, program of work for the community I think Please. That was addressed more to us, though. What would be a reason for a corrupted political institution to implement blockchain? It wouldn't. So um, the difference. Sorry. Why would a, so the question is why would a corrupted political institution or um, a political jurisdiction adopt a blockchain? My claim or our claim is that they wouldn't. The problem that we have in um, there's, there's a couple of ways to think about how we can get poor countries to become rich countries. And, and these days, most people agree that the problem is bad institutions. Um, uh, the institutional economists have been convincing on this point. But our response so far, we've, we've said, yes, okay. The problem with you, uh, the poor country, is that you are, um, you've got a lot of corrupt institutions. And then the poor countries say, well, what should we do about that? And we respond with, well, don't, don't be so corrupt. That's no help <laughs> whatsoever um, uh, because, you know, corruption exists for a reason. Um, and, and until now, our only response to, say, a corrupt legal system has been reform the legal system. That's really hard because there are rent seekers and people get benefits out of the bad legal system. We suddenly now have a technology where you could choose, for instance, to enforce a contract in the old corrupt legal system or on a blockchain or any number of blockchains. And, and the government really can't do much about it. Yes, we have the interface question, how would you enforce those contracts if, if they require physical enforcement? But um, in many financial contracts, the ones that we're concerned about, you can enforce those on the blockchain or on a chain or on some sort of distributed ledger. Um, and you don't have to fix all the bad, corrupt, institutions. This is a unique change. And we move from a development strategy that is just, you know, either send Western experts into poor countries and tell them just to be less corrupt or do so with tanks and all that sort of thing. Now entrepreneurs can build other frameworks, other institutional frameworks on which they can achieve some of their goals. I think that's that's a really um, weird and exciting thing, and for, is a good portent for the future. I have an answer as well, but it's it's. Is it going to be better than mine? Or? <laughs> 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 um, it depends what you mean by country. If by country you mean Russia, Venezuela, Venezuela, yes. So, but what, what you have in mind there is there's a a a, a political elite, and then there's a the people. And uh, people can adopt the blockchain independently. Um, now, they obviously can't do it over assets, you know, oil reserves and, and, and things where the, the government has the, the, the claim with the threat of you know, cages and so on. Um, but where we're observing this actually happening in real time is intellectual property. So a group of artists can decide that this is the protocol we're going to use to represent this form of art. If you've got the keys, you own it. Um, and so new types of property rights can emerge when a community 
decides that this is how we're going to create resources and share resources and transfer value. Um, and that community is defined as just that which uses the protocol or adopts the protocol. So community can itself match um, in, in that sense. And what's interesting here is that you know, we're quite used to, to emergent communities, but we always think of them as communicative objects or, or, or of social communities that, that communicate in a language group and that's on. What is new here is the idea that they can take with them and build for themselves in a self-sovereign sense property rights, um, which then become a basis for contract and identity and, and other sort of just basic economic infrastructure. So this idea of a, of a um, again, just our language isn't quite up to this. We, we have this notion of a secessionist group that goes off and starts a new country right, well, um, through war. But we don't have this idea of, a self, of an emergent economy um, because all economies that emerge are still in other economies. They're still working with existing property rights and so on. So this, this notion of, of self-sovereign economy um, actually emerging um, in broken places, um, but also in, in perfectly well-functioning places. But you know, the, reason, the reason intellectual property is, is, is an interesting thing to study is intellectual property works really well in countries. It just works really badly between countries. So whenever you have, um, just because cost of life is right, just for that reason. Um, so whenever you have low cost intellectual property sort of, um, that, that wants to be global, um, this is an obvious sort of type of, of thing to emerge in that space. Now, what do you call that? Is that a country? It's, it's, a, commu it's a community of people that are doing governance and They've got money, and they've got a native money and a native platform and, and property rights, and you know, those are, those are all of the things that we normally think of as you know, they don't have United Nations representation, but short of that, we're kind of describing the emergence of a country. Um, so I think that notion, one of my colleagues, um, Trent McDonald, has spoken about this in terms of crypto secession. This idea that um, what we're observing here is 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 a, is a new sort of Community making of economies by their by self chosen constitutional rules. Um, that's a technology enabled thing that we haven't really ever seen before in history. Um, so, yeah, interesting to see where this goes. You're up. <laughs> um, the way you speak about intellectual property in particular has me puzzled. I certainly believe that this technology is going to give us systems of property rights that are much stronger, much less corruptible, much more flexible than anything we've seen before. But the phrase intellectual property generally uh, is uh, talking about the scarcity of use of information made public. And, yeah. and um, once information is revealed, there is no technology that can prevent its retention and further distribution. Um, you know, the, the Streisand effect mm -hmm. that the attempt to censor uh, uh, just brings more attention and causes the information mm -hmm. to get uh, farther um, distributed. I think intellectual property, understood in terms of scarcity of information, simply becomes impossible in this new world. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is, this is something that might be able to repeat it already. Right, so, so the, the, the question is around the nature of intellectual property in a, in a blockchain world. Like it, it really could go in one or two direct, in, in several directions. So first thing to notice is that you know, intellectual property is, is, is artificial. Right? It was 17th century, such a grand. Um, so the, the, 16th, no, 17th century. century. Yeah. Um, to create an artificial monopoly that is state-enforced in order to solve the problem of creating a high-powered incentive to invest in, in novelty and then share that. That novelty, right? So it's a it's a creature of the state to create a monopoly, um, but it's also a property right, and because it can be traded and exchanged, it has, it's a it's a vehicle for holding economic value, and it's a monopoly that's artificially created, and it's a mechanism for communicating information. You can have the right, my right to suppress your knowing something might be a right that I can trade. But what use is the right if I cannot prevent you from knowing something? Right? The, the intellectual property, no matter how tradable it is, 
is a right that is completely unenforceable, is meaningless in the world of, di of, of digital networks. Whether mm -hmm. we have blockchain or not, mm -hmm. simply the coming of digital networks uh, uh, you know, made intellectual property in the sense of scarcity of information, mm -hmm. scarcity of copying information, impossible. Yeah. Uh, okay, I agree with that. That's, uh, that's, that's, that's a strong point. Um, the other thing I've noticed is that the way intellectual property has traditionally been done, the thing that was always missing from it was payments and, and verification that someone was using something. So that, that kind of proof that someone was using something and the, and the payments, that was all had to be added on separately, which is the reason it broke so, one of the reasons it broke so badly is that it only works above a certain scale. Um, superstars, music superstars, works perfectly well for them. Most people it doesn't um, for, because of the, the non-native payments or non-native um, registry, registration of use aspect of it. Um, but I think it's, it's, this is one of these things where I think this will evolve again. Um, that, that this, this, is a, this is a rupture um, that fundamentally breaks the way intellectual property currently works um, because um, or it creates a new, new possibility for, for how it can work. But now it could potentially work in a world with digital payments, with native digital payments and native digital registries. Um, it's unclear how, whether, how that will evolve and, and what the, where that will take things. I, I, they, we're seeing the invention of new forms of intellectual property, and I suspect that we're going to see the empowerment of a um, type of intellectual property that um, w was not seen as so significant. So new forms of intellectual property. CryptoKitties is a new form of intellectual property. Um, uh, the question is, is that an indicative, is that a harbinger of something, or is that just a cute thing that happened once? Um, uh, it may be a bit of both. Um, but I, I like to think about this in the data access context. So um, what's, we're all worried about you know, the data that goes to Facebook or Google or something like that, or, or to Ashley Madison or something that's you know, um, famously leaked. Um, what we are, in fact, as humans, what we are more protective of and what as entrepreneurs or people acting in an economy we're more interested in is not these snapshots of data, but access to an ongoing movement of data. And if you think about intellectual property as access to stuff that changes over time. Um, uh, so it's all, or it would be bad if your Facebook private messages were leaked. It would be significantly worse and more valuable um, to anyone if information about your messages over time were leaked. And that's precisely, think about it, we, we, we've talked a lot about health data markets. Um, it's all well and good to get a snapshot of your, your, your fitness at a, any given moment, but what companies want to buy from you is not just your fitness at any given moment, but either the fitness of everyone at any given moment or you over time. And that's where the value is. And that's a new way of thinking about intellectual property. I think we're, we're stuck on thinking about IP as simply um, a movie or um, a book or something like that. Well, that's copyright as opposed to patents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but, but we're talking about stuff that changes over time is a form of intellectual property that we don't have good legal categories and we don't have good economic categories, but turns out is really significant. All right. All right. Thank you very much.